The idyllic islands of French Polynesia may seem like a relaxing paradise of pristine reefs and clear waters. But take a dip below the surface. Are you ready for a swim? Bacarava is a rectangular-shaped atoll located in French Polynesia in the South Pacific Ocean. The southern pass of Bacarava is known as the Grey Shark Wall due to having the highest concentration of grey reef sharks in the world. Since 2006, the sharks have been protected from fishing, which is attributed to their population increase. During the day, the sharks are fairly docile and conserve energy ready to hunt their prey at night. Although the exact number of sharks found in Vakarava is uncertain, with only 650 human residents, it's likely the people are outnumbered. If you're afraid of coming down and, and going and swimming in the ocean because of sharks, you should be terrified to make a piece of toast. 400 people died last year from defective toasters, whereas less than 10 did from sharks. This is the first large shark expedition like this in the Western Gulf. We'll be tagging hammerhead sharks, tiger sharks, and mako sharks trying to understand how they're leveraging the Gulf in their birthing, mating, and full migratory patterns. We'll be getting up every day just before dawn. The fishing team will be going out, getting all of our lines rigged and ready to go. And then we'll get the ship in position with a lift in the water. And we'll be looking to capture, bring sharks back to the lift, lift them up out of the water. And once we do that, a whole team of scientists from a half dozen institutions will circle around the shark and we'll conduct 12 research projects in about 15 minutes, then release the shark and open source the tracking to the world so that everyone can follow it. What we're finding is that these massive sharks have huge, huge movements across the ocean. We have one of these white sharks, Lydia, who's traveled over 35,000 miles in just two years. Very, very regular for these sharks to be swimming 1,000 miles a month, which is why it's so important to figure out where they go we're losing 200,000 sharks a day for shark fin soup, 100 million a year. You know, people need to understand an ocean with no sharks means an ocean with no fish. They are the lion, the balance keeper of the ocean. And if they are not there, the whole food chain collapses. This is a simple battle. We gotta solve the puzzle of these sharks' lives to make sure they flourish and make a difference for the future. I recently told somebody that getting attacked by a shark was the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. They're like, that's absurd, or that, you know, why would you say that? I've had incredible opportunities. I've been able to visit some really cool places, meet some incredible people. All these things have been nurtured from this shark attack. I think it's really made me who I am today. My name is Mike Coots. I live in the island of Kauai in Hawaii. I'm a surfer, photographer, and shark attack survivor. There's some really great surf spots out here. I was 18 years old surfing here on Kauai with some friends, and it was early in the morning and I paddled out and thought I was gonna have a surf session like any other day, and it was a lot different. I got attacked by a tiger shark. As soon as I hit it, it let go and, and disappeared back underwater, and I remember passing out basically as soon as we got to the hospital, and I woke up a day and a half later an amputee. I got my first prosthetic six months after the shark attack. Early on, you think you can't do this, you think you can't do that, you know, there's these physical limitations on life, and I didn't think I could drive a truck with a stick shift. And you learn how to drive a truck with a stick shift, and you're like, wow, that was cool. And you build up these little things, like, day to day to day. After a while, it's like, bring it on. What, what can happen that I can't figure out how to do? I was in college, and I remember class got out. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, take a longboard, I'm gonna get the biggest board I can find and just take my prosthetic in the water and see what happens. I caught a wave and I was screaming pretty loud. I was like, what, this is cool, this is amazing. And I think that was like the best wave I had ever caught in my life. From then on, I started figuring out, okay, what's gonna break? What can I make that's a foot that'll help me surf even better? And trying to basically make the ultimate surfing foot. 
I think I, I'm doing it because it's fun, but I'm also, it's this learning experience and it's taking this information and passing it on to people that want to surf with a prosthetic. The ocean has taken a lot for me, but what it's given back to me has been immeasurable. I've lost, you know, nearly my life to a shark, yet I really believe sharks are one of the, if not the most important species in our marine ecosystem. And at the rate that they're being killed off, they're not gonna be around in 10, 15, 20 years. And why not use something that could, I guess, be set as a negative and, and turn into a positive? The shark attack's been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I've had an absolute fascination with sharks since I was a little kid. I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist by the time I was five, and I got to snorkel with my first shark when I was about eight years old, and I was literally hooked on these awesome animals. I'm Jillian Morris. I am a shark conservationist, a shark diver, and an underwater videographer. I've traveled all over the world, and I have to say that Bimini has some of the bluest waters I've ever seen. All different shades. Some people joke about the 50 shades of blue in Bimini. The island is really, really small. It's about six miles long, but the world just below the surface is really what's incredible. That blue, crystal clear water is teeming with marine life and is the reason why we live on this tiny little island. The Great Hammerhead dive site is about a quarter of a mile offshore. It's a place where in very shallow water, you're able to get in and see these very large sharks up close and personal. It's very rare to actually be able to be in the water with so many of them like we can here in Bimini, especially in crystal clear shallow water. Unfortunately, sharks get a really bad reputation. They're not man-eating monsters. They're not mindless eating machines. They're actually really intelligent, social, incredible animals. They're also really incredible for the health of our oceans, which all of us rely on every single day. There's something really special about hammerheads. I have been in the water with some very big sharks, including great whites and tiger sharks, but nothing compares to the great hammerhead. The way they move, their power, their grace, they can turn on a dime, and they have those wide set eyes. They're my favorite animal on the planet, and being able to dive with them as much as we do, I feel really, really lucky. I remember the first time I jumped in, I was scared to death. You know that it has the, the power to mangle you in a, a second, but it chooses not to, and that fascinates me. My name is Andreas B. Haida. I'm a sailor, adventurer, and a marine biologist from Norway. This is my third season in northern Norway, where I spent the winter with my boat Barba. It's harsh and it's also tremendously beautiful. There is no sign of, of people. To me, it's nature at its very best. Our goal for this season is to make a documentary about uh, orcas and whales in the wild. What makes the interaction with orcas so special is that you know that it's the apex predator of the sea. It has a tremendous power. Often we have to observe them from distance and uh, at some point they are relaxed and you can approach them and uh, that's when you get them playful. They're so gentle, yet so fast, and they're so powerful, yet so very calm and, and peaceful. To me, these whales and the era they're in, they're kind of the pinnacle of, of interacting with nature. Once you've made eye contact with an orca, there is uh, no turning back. It's a moment you never forget. Welcome to Hanson Island, a remote place on the west coast of Canada, about 10 kilometers long and 2 kilometers wide. This island belongs to two groups, 
the First Nations and the Oka. For most of my life, I've had the great good fortune of living here in this incredible environment and studying this incredible creature. And it's given me a sense of peace in the world. I want everybody to have that same experience. My name is Paul Spohn, and 47 years ago, I was a young scientist at the University of British Columbia, and part of my job was to study an orca in captivity at the Vancouver Aquarium. I came to understand that orcas are acoustic creatures because they're using sound to locate their prey. They get what they need to live from sound. They should not be penned up in concrete tanks that deprive them of the sound of the ocean that they were born into. Ultimately, that knowledge led me to search for a place in the wild where I could study orcas, totally without interfering with them. And that search led me to Hanson Island, where I set up Orca Lab. We built a network of half a dozen hydrophones that cover 50 square kilometers of the surrounding area. And they give us live audio so we can track their movements, often 24 hours a day. 61 and 60 are right there. Yeah. For me, one of the greatest experiences here is putting on a pair of earphones and just listening. And then we have speakers in the forest, near the tents, near the outhouse, near the camp kitchen, all of the spaces around here. One of the things you can't help noticing and feeling is the sudden intrusion of a boat, of a vessel, of a propeller. It's jarring. Here at Orca Lab, we listen to untold quantities of boat noise. It's really annoying. We can always walk away from it, but whales can't. It disrupts their communication. It disrupts their ability to hunt. We've had quite a few breaches as well. Uh -huh. I think from a point of view of the welfare of the whales, something that has to be dealt with. What I want to do is develop the ability for people to get to feel empathy for the creature. Since 2000, we've streamed live audio so that anybody with computer access to the internet can listen to exactly what we listen to in our lab. Oh, look, it's right up at the... What we're trying to do is give people a taste of what it is to be an orca in this magnificent environment. In doing that, they will come to care and want to protect nature. I believe that if I can share what I have experienced, the world could know peace. <laughs>